Hi, it's Peter. Welcome to St. Alfred's Online. Today, Mike McNamara is going to preach from Luke 4, that passage that's known in some quarters as the Nazareth Manifesto, when Jesus preaches in a synagogue in Nazareth and tells us why he's come. It's a great passage, and I'm really looking forward to what Mike has to say. I'm also going to interview two members of St. Alfred's, Edwina Faithful Farmer and Matthew Mori, both of whom work for international mission agencies. I'm going to ask them how they're going, how their mission agencies are going during this period of COVID-19 lockdown, and whether Luke 4 has informed their thinking and their work in any way. Also, if you're a family with children, uh, you can find resources to help them uh, as they engage with God on our Stacks Online page. You'll find that on the front page of our website. And that Ross and Naomi have got a fun instalment for you today. That would be great. And if you're a teenager or a parent of teenagers and you'd like them to connect with our youth ministry, then go to our Pulse Online as well. Um, on the bottom of our St Alfred's Online page, you'll find a form that you can fill in and give us some details about who you are and whether you have any questions or any feedback for us. We'd love to hear from you. We're getting a lot of feedback, which is really encouraging. And even if you're not a member of St Alfred's, we'd love to hear from you. If you have any questions or any prayer requests, just go to that form, fill it in. Your details will be handled confidentially. We won't be uh, inundating you with lots of uh, emails or anything like that. And we'd love to hear from you, to pray for you and to encourage you in your faith. Now we're going to just uh, quieten ourselves down, we're going to have a moment of, of silence, and then I'm going to lead us in a prayer after which we're going to sing a couple of songs. Let's pause in silence for a moment. Let us pray. Gracious God, we humbly thank you for life and health and safety, for freedom to work, leisure to rest, and for all that is beautiful in creation and human life. But above all, we praise you for our Saviour, Jesus Christ, for his death and resurrection, for the gift of your spirit, and for the hope of sharing in your glory. Fill our hearts with all joy and peace in believing. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now let us join together in singing, Only a Holy God. commands all the hosts of heaven who else could make every king bow down who else can whisper and darkness trembles only a holy God what are the beauty demands such praises what are the splendor that shines the sun what are the majesty rules with justice only a holy God come and behold him the one and the 
else could rescue me from my fate. Who else would offer his only son? Who else invites me to call him father? Only a holy God. Only my
It's my pleasure to welcome Edwina Faithful Farmer uh, to join us today. Edwina is the International Program Director for CBM, and CBM is an international agency that uh, tries to improve the lives of those who have disabilities, and they work all over the world. So welcome this morning, or today, I should say, uh, Edwina. And just firstly, I want to ask, how are you doing personally, and how is CBM doing during this time of lockdown? Thank you, Peter. Yeah, it's interesting time, isn't it? So like most people, uh, we're working from home here. I'm working from home uh, and Doug's also here. We've got plenty of room. We're very fortunate. Um, I miss seeing the kids. I've missed being locked down and I hear now that we can be less locked down. I'm looking forward to that. So I'm meeting online with my team and with my senior management colleagues. Um, so in some ways that saves time, uh, but I miss the face-to-face -face presence. Uh, it's very draining. And making difficult decisions on online is interesting. <laughs> I have found that uh, it's quite stressful. In six weeks, we've managed to uh, do quite a lot, as well as get all our staff working from home. We've talked with our partners overseas, and m most of those programs are now redirected to address COVID, the ones that haven't just had to stop. Uh, and we also hear that our own government in Australia is likely to cut funds for overseas aid. So we're pretty concerned about that. We think that's short-sighted and we really want to support ongoing work. Um, and I think key consideration for me really in my work is how we support our partner organisations overseas, working with some of the poorest and you know, most vulnerable people. What are they experiencing and how do we make sure that the needs of people with disability are addressed? Um, there's two main ways that we do that. We, we um, provide practical assistance and, and services, and now for COVID basic provisions. And also we're influencing others to make sure that what they're doing is including people with disability because it, it's they're readily left behind. So we're making sure that that's happening. I mean, a good number of our partner organisations that are implementing in country are locked down and can't move between countries. So between regions, I mean, so that, that some things are halted, but um, not everything. and. Perceptions, interestingly, perceptions of the virus vary. Some of them really feel that the virus will soon be over. How come you're asking us to think about um, think about this? We just want to get on with our programs. I think that thinking is, is um, a little less usual, but that's a different perception than ours. And we know that many people will struggle to have food and basic needs. If you need to work to eat and your work shuts down, as we've seen in Northern India, people streaming out of cities uh, to get back to their rural homes. And one of our partner organisations that's on a main road um, said, yes, we want to provide food packages for these people. So we um, so we talked to them about that. Or people that are, rely on public transport or, or um, autos or tuk-tuks to get, get transport and can't because their mobility is reduced, they're going to struggle to get their basic needs met, food and um, things. So and very aware that getting the right information to the right people is really important because we know that uh, a lot of people with disability who are at home and much less mobile, very isolated and potentially very marginalised, are very fearful. Um, they're very, they're afraid of uh, what will happen to them. They don't understand what the virus is and if they'll get it, how to protect themselves. So we're making sure that information is getting to those people and if you don't read or you don't hear or you've got poor vision then you need sign language information radio announcements braille pamphlets so making sure that information is getting out in those forms um, and so we're making sure that we're also working with governments so that they understand in country that they need to include people with disability in how to do that and so we're helping um, people with disability who are leaders in the community to speak to government and bring the evidence of what they know is needed. And mental health's a key thing, as it is here. We're hearing quite a lot about that on our media here. And we've got partners in Indonesia and Nepal that were working in mental health and are continuing to do so in COVID. Um, so they're not able to meet with individuals or groups anymore, but they're now moving to online and using telephones for counselling and, and also helping people to get critical access to medicine. So a whole breadth of stuff. Um, so it all remains very relevant and uh, partners have been able to do an amazing job to make sure that the people there are really concerned about uh, uh, having their needs met the best way they can. 
Thanks, Edwina. It's a very uh, complicated world that uh, you're working with and it's really important work. Um, as you know, today we're thinking about this passage from Luke 4 where Jesus talks a lot about compassion and justice and working with those who are most marginalised. Um, has this passage shaped your work or thinking in any way? Yeah, it's a really, it's a really great passage. And, I, you know, Jesus really saying that um, he's the amazing person that Isaiah was talking about in all those really, um, those really interesting, quite uh, strong um, prophecies. And, and I was reflecting that it's a bit like his mission statement, that this is what you'll see when you see my kingdom coming. Um, it does really speak to me because it, it makes it clear to me that these are the people that really matter to him, um, people in physical and spiritual need, um, people who are uh, poor, who are oppressed, struggling with um, all sorts of things, and this will be exacerbated in COVID. Uh, and when I see the point that uh, the point there about um, oppression, and I was reflecting that you know if you're born with a disability in some countries. Uh, and, and that's evident, then you, you aren't registered at birth, you are then not vaccinated, you're not able to go to school. Um, it'll be much harder for you to then get a job. You won't be able to get a licence and you can't vote and you can't stand for parliament. So if that's not unjust uh, and inequitable, I'm absolutely certain Jesus doesn't want that happening. Uh, so that really touches my heart, that kind of just uh, systemic inequity um, and this really encourages me because it, it yeah, I, this is obviously where where his heart is. It really strikes me. It's very inspiring. So that, that's where his concern is. Edwina, thank you for this little window into your work and the work of CBM and please be assured of our prayers. Thank you, Peter. And I really appreciate that. Today's reading is from Luke chapter 4, verses 14 to 30. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? they asked. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself, and you will tell me, Do hear in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the sky was shut for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked away right through the crowd and went on his way. This is the word of the Lord.
Hallow. Anyone who was there would never forget it. It was February the 10th, 2007. A relatively unknown young senator called Barack Obama, who had come to call Chicago his home, stood outside the old state capitol building to address a huge crowd that had gathered to hear him. Obama declared that he was going to run for president. The crowd erupted with applause and chanted his name endlessly. There was excitement and anticipation about where all this was going to lead. 2,000 years earlier, another young man, Jesus of Nazareth, came back to his hometown on a wave of popular approval. The whole region of Galilee was becoming excited about his remarkable teaching, and news about him was quickly spreading. He preached in a few of the local synagogues, the Jewish places of worship. But what would he do in Nazareth, his hometown? Well, they were soon to find out. I imagine it was standing room only when Jesus entered the Nazareth synagogue on that Sabbath day. Synagogues had no priests or rabbis and relied on local preachers of good reputation for the teaching. So with the growing interest in Jesus and with this being his hometown, it was no surprise that he was invited to read the scriptures and to preach. He was handed the scroll of Isaiah to read from. He stood up, unrolled it, and then Luke tells us that he found the place where it was written. Clearly, Jesus deliberately chose the portion of scripture that he especially wanted to read out. There were verses from Isaiah chapter 61. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Having finished the reading, Jesus then rolled up the scroll and sat down. But what would happen now? Everyone was clearly hoping and expecting that Jesus would preach to them, just as he'd done in the other places. Luke tells us the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on them. The anticipation was palpable. And then Jesus spoke these words. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What a remarkable thing to claim. What did he mean by it? Well, I believe Jesus meant two things. First, to establish who he was, the Messiah. And second, to set out his mission plan. This was the Nazareth Manifesto of Jesus. The title Messiah or Christ means anointed one. And Jesus is declaring here that he is the anointed one, the promised Messiah sent by God that the people of Israel had been waiting for for so many years. And it was foretold by the prophets. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Jesus establishes his true identity in front of the townspeople of Nazareth. Then using the very words of Isaiah's prophecy, he describes what his spirit-led ministry will look like. It's a combination of proclamation and acts of love, of word and deed. So first, proclamation. He will proclaim good news to the poor, both the poor in literal terms, they were always valued by the Lord Jesus, and the poor in spiritual terms, those who recognised their deep need of God and looked to Jesus for help. He would proclaim freedom for the prisoners, those captive to sin yet who longed to be set free and discover a new way of living. Of course, God speaks to literal prisoners too. The Prisoners Christian Fellowship started by Charles Coulson and also the Prison Network 
have stories to tell of changed lives. Some years ago, in the UK, a man I knew who had recently become a Christian in the church I attended, and also who had a very colourful past, decided to go to the local police station to confess the crimes that he'd uh, been guilty of but never been charged for. The crimes were checked out. They weren't sure about this guy just rocked up at a police station, confessing all. But they checked it, verified it, and then assured my friend that he would get a custodial sentence. To which my friend said, yes, but at least I'll be free. The police officer replied, no, mate, you'll be behind bars. Again, my friend said, yes, I know, but at least I'll be free. Jesus' message sets prisoners free. Jesus would proclaim the year of the Lord's favour as well. Now was to be the time of God's favour. God's Son was on the earth. And when we consider the riches of Jesus' teaching, the, the wonder of his miracles, and the message of forgiveness and new life that he proclaimed, we know that there was no greater moment of God's favour in all of human history. Ultimately, Jesus would die on the cross for our sins and rise again in order to usher in a new era of salvation, an extended era of God's salvation and favour. With Jesus, God's message of love would be proclaimed as never before, but there would also be acts of love as never before. There would be recovery of sight for the blind, as promised in Psalm 146. Blind Bartimaeus, remember him? He was just one of those whose sight was restored. He was a man who came to see physically, but also spiritually too. Very like the blind man in John chapter 9 who after being healed by Jesus declares, Lord, I believe. And from that point on, he became a follower of Jesus. The oppressed would be set free. The oppressed in Jesus' day included the widows, the children, the poor, the sick, especially lepers who were outcasts. All discovered that Jesus valued them. Then there were the hated and the unpopular, people like Zacchaeus, the tax collector, who worked for the Romans, the occupying enemy force. Much to Zacchaeus' surprise, he found friendship with Jesus. It's in Luke 19. Then there were also the demon-possessed, like Legion, who found that Jesus' power could break the shackles of the evil one. It's in Luke 8. There were the anxious, such as the woman who reached out to touch Jesus' cloak and had her health and dignity restored. She was finally at peace after years of worry. If you're anxious about anything, your health, your finances, relationships, employment, coronavirus, whatever it is, remember how Jesus cares for you. Peter McPherson, in the beginning of our online series, preached from 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxieties upon Jesus because he cares for you. Back now to the Nazareth synagogue. When Jesus had finished teaching, the first batch of reviews came in, rather like a first night at the theatre. All spoke well of him, we're told, and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. It seemed that what others had been saying about Jesus around the traps, they were now saying too. He'd amazed them, and they were impressed. But then they quickly began to have second thoughts. Perhaps the religious affairs correspondent of the Jerusalem Times had been in the back row all along. Whatever it was, they soon changed their verdict on Jesus. 
Jesus spoke gracious words and so on. But, and then they say it, isn't this Joseph's son? Luke doesn't record any more words spoken by the synagogue crowd. He doesn't need to. The subtext is very clear. We are being duped by one of our own. This young man grew up here, served an apprenticeship with Joseph as a carpenter, and now he comes back here with all this fine talk. Well, it won't wash with us. Let's have some proof. He's done miracles in Capernaum. Why doesn't he do them here in his hometown? They never said that out loud, but Jesus could clearly read their thoughts because he says to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, do here in your hometown what you have heard I did in Capernaum. The proverb that Jesus says they'd like to quote at him is basically saying, save your reputation while you can, Jesus. You're the great doctor healer, so do something to impress us. We're not interested in all your fine words. We want to see the sort of miracles you did in Capernaum. They brought in their verdict on Jesus. It was unspoken, but Jesus knew it anyway. Now Jesus brings in his verdict on them. Truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. You could almost hear the muttering of the people when Jesus claims to be a prophet. But if they thought that was bad, Jesus hadn't really got started. He goes on to tell them about two great prophets of Israel, Elijah and Elisha. Jesus explains that God called these two prophets to bless the lives of people outside of Israel, from Sidon and Syria, because the Israelites, the people of the prophet's home nation, had become so disobedient and rebellious. The people in the Nazareth synagogue quickly pick up what Jesus is saying here. In effect, Jesus is saying, just as Elijah and Elisha couldn't bless a widow or a leper of Israel, their home nation, nor can I bless you here in Nazareth, my hometown, because you're just as rebellious and disbelieving as the Israelites were in the days of Elijah and Elisha. Well, this was too much for them to take, and the response is swift, angry, and violent. All the people in the synagogue, we're told, were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove Jesus out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. From initial amazement to attempted murder in a matter of a few minutes, total rejection by the people of Nazareth. They don't succeed in their wicked plan to kill Jesus. Jesus, his majesty and authority plainly evident, walks right through the hostile crowd like a knife goes through butter. Jesus goes on his way to fulfill the mission he had launched that very day when he read from Isaiah 61 and declared, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. It was an extraordinary scene, an extraordinary day, full of drama, revelation, and sadly, disbelief. And so the question comes, what can we take away from such an historic moment in Jesus' life? Well, I want to focus on just two things, one negative and one positive. The negative, expect rejection if you follow Jesus. 
Jesus had graciously chosen to launch his mission in his hometown. The people there had the most coveted ringside seats in all history, but they didn't know it and rejected Jesus, never realizing that he wasn't in fact Joseph's son, he was God's son. Jesus would later tell his disciples, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. To follow the way of the cross means being prepared for, to face rejection or deep misunderstanding, perhaps from family or friends, or from work colleagues or neighbours, and all because you choose to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps you're facing that kind of experience at the moment. Are you prepared to face it if that's not the case for you just yet? Ask for God's strength to keep you faithful to him. The negative and then the positive. Cherish the privilege of following Jesus. You see, Jesus boldly read out those words from Isaiah 61. And I'm sure that I speak for all believers when I say what a privilege it is to serve such a Lord, such a King. The King who died and rose again for us and reigns on high in heaven. And this same King, Jesus, has entrusted to us, his servants, the privilege of continuing his kingdom ministry in the power of the Holy Spirit here on earth. That means proclaiming good news to all who would hear, proclaiming the year of the Lord's favour. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, now is the time of God's favour. Now is the time of salvation. Last year was our year of mission with Explore. But every year is a year of mission. So who is the Lord laying on your heart and my heart to pray for so that they too can discover true freedom in Jesus? The privilege of serving the King, the Messiah, also means we are to give ourselves to the acts of love, just as he did. To the poor, the marginalised, the hungry, the sick, the prisoner, the lonely and the grieving. God's hands are our hands. What can you and I do to make a difference and demonstrate God's love through our own acts of love? It might be local, it might be national, it might be international. Listen to a couple of interviews that are to come a little later. Finally, whatever we proclaim and whatever we do, may it all give glory to God's anointed one, the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you this week. Jesus, you are mercy. Jesus, you are justice. Jesus, you are worthy. That is what you are. You died alone to save me. You rose so you could raise me. You did this all to make me a chosen child of God. Jesus, you are mercy. Jesus, you are justice. Jesus, you are worthy. That is what you are. You died alone to save me. You rose so you could raise me. You did this all to make me a chosen child of God. Mighty is the
Father, thank you for this new day that you have made. Thank you for senses to enjoy your good gifts. The bright autumn leaves and trees that have multicolored leaves have been a feast for the eyes, reminding us of your beauty and your glory. Thank you that we can now visit friends and family a bit more freely. May we treasure and be all the more thankful for the people in our lives. Thank you, Jesus, for obeying your Father perfectly and for not giving in to the temptations from Satan during what must have been 40 agonizing days in the desert. Because of your obedience then, today we can have fellowship with you and, and we too can walk in obedience. Thank you for leaving the comfort of fellowship with your Father and the Holy Spirit to enter our broken world, to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoner, healing for the sick, and release for the oppressed. Father, thank you that you are with us in the challenges we face in life, that you promise never to leave or forsake us. We pray for our world, our nation, and ourselves. Please give wisdom and energy to leaders of international organizations, governments, scientists, and researchers in every decision and action that needs to be made around the COVID-19 pandemic. Proverbs 21, 1 tells us that the king's heart is like a stream of water directed by the Lord. He guides it wherever he pleases. We ask that you would be orchestrating all decisions so that your priorities of compassion, justice and righteousness are fulfilled. We pray especially for vulnerable groups around the world who are suffering right now, for women and girls who are more prone to violence at these times, for the poor who have likely lost their livelihoods due to lockdown, who are hungry at this moment 
and who lack access to clean water and sanitation. And because of crowded living conditions, malnutrition and illness are made all the more vulnerable to the virus. For people with disabilities and widows who are outcasts in some societies and are likely to become even more marginalised as a result of the pandemic. You do not forget these, your image bearers for whom Christ died. Thank you for the many NGOs, religious groups and Christians around the world who are serving the most vulnerable. Please may they and we not become compassion weary, but pray for and have our eyes opened to the ways you're calling us to respond. May this pandemic lead to a more just society, not to a world that has even greater disparity between the rich and poor. Thank you for our national and state leaders and for the wisdom you've been giving them. Please continue to guide them and especially we pray for wisdom about when to reopen schools here in Victoria. Please be with anxious students and parents and may there be clarity soon. We also thank you for our leaders here at St Alphs and for the blessing, the services, emails and phone calls, plus all the other things that they do behind the scenes are to us. Please encourage and strengthen them as they also feel the loss of community. We pray for our link missionaries, Mike and Catherine, with their little boy Simon in South Asia. Please continue to bless their language study. Give them creative ways to occupy Simon too during the restrictions. Please anoint them with your spirit and give them joy and perseverance in this unexpected situation. Please prepare them and others for deeper relationships when there is more freedom to meet face to face. Lord, please use us to be a source of encouragement to our brothers and sisters and any who are in need at this time. May you give us servant hearts that are willing and ready to respond because we know how deeply we are loved and cared for by you, our Father. And now let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. It's my pleasure now to welcome Matthew Morrie, who's joining us. Uh, Matthew is the National Director of TIER Australia and a member of St Alfred's. Uh, TIER is an international aid agency that's concerned about issues of justice and compassion. And you may know of TIER's work here at St Alfred's through the Useful Gifts catalogue that comes out about Christmas time each year and the Justice Conference. So welcome to you today, Matthew. And just want to ask first and foremost, uh, how are you doing? How is TIER doing during this time of lockdown? Yeah, thanks, Peter. It's uh, good to be with you. Look, I think like everybody, uh, it's been a difficult time with lots of changes and lots of adjustments that we've had to make. Uh, the entire tier team, which is based here in Blackburn, is working from home um, and trying to figure out how to do our work remotely and using tools like Zoom and um, all these new ways of thinking about how we work as a team. Uh, but the bigger impact actually on us has been the impact on our partners uh, and their work in Africa and Asia and the Pacific. Um, and for many of them, really, the worst is yet to come. I mean, we're at the point of the curve having been flattened and we're seeing ourselves kind of coming out of the worst of it. But many of them, the, the future still looks quite dire. Um, and that's both from an economic standpoint, where we're expecting um, the economic situation to actually be the worst it's been um, in decades for the global poor. 
We know the, um, the food security situation also is a dire concern. In fact, the BBC had a report last week saying that they're expecting famines in Africa of biblical proportions because of COVID-19. Um, and then most of the places we work, the health systems and the social safety nets are nothing like we're blessed with here in Australia. So um, the systems just aren't set up to cope with what's going to be a very difficult time. So, so our partners and the work that they're doing um, in the community is usually as with and through the local church uh, is really pivoting towards how do they prepare communities so that they have um, the support and structures and the health messages and things to prevent things being as bad as they could be, um, but also looking forward and saying, how are we going to help support families as they go through this really difficult season? Well, that's uh, quite a load for you, Matthew, and I'm, I'm sure you and your team are working very hard uh, to try and adapt to this changing situation, which you're saying it, it could get even worse for some of your partners. Um, as you know, today we're thinking about uh, Jesus speaking in the synagogue in Nazareth, where he, he lays out a sort of mani manifesto or a mandate uh, for us to be involved in in poor and uh, showing just uh, showing compassion to those in need has this passage shaped your thinking your approach to your work in any way yeah thanks peter yeah i look for um has had a huge impact on my life um and this manifesto that jesus brings um, and i suppose looking at look for in the broader sweep of scriptures and recognizing that this isn't a standalone um, call to care for the, those on the margins, but it's actually part of this broader biblical narrative that we serve a God of justice and a God who cares for the poor, the sick, those on the, the edges of society. Uh, and when I first became a Christian, a lot of my orientation and my understanding of good news and salvation was much more of an individualistic and a kind of a spiritual side of things that we're being saved for something else, you know, for heaven. Um, but as I, my, I grew in my discipleship and um, started studying scriptures, I recognized that what Jesus is proclaiming here is a discipleship that impacts not just our spiritual lives, but the way that we live our lives in the world around us and the ways that we treat others and particularly how we care for those on the margins, um, which has shaped my vocation, shapes the reason why I work for a ministry like Tears, uh, and shapes the way that Tear engages with Australian Christians and says, actually, if we serve a God of justice, and that's meant to to shape the way that we live our lives as the people of God, then it needs to shape the way that we think about the systems that we're contributing to and, and building a more just world. So the clothes that we buy, are they ethically produced? The way that we invest our superannuation funds, the way that we make choices about the environment, the way that we relate to our indigenous brothers and sisters, all of these have a practical outworking of the kingdom of God, of the good news, um, and of a proclamation of the kingdom. So yeah, it's had a huge impact. Thanks, Matthew. That's uh, very encouraging and, and certainly challenging for all of us. And uh, I want to say uh, thank you from all of us at St. Alfred's for your work. And we, uh, we pray for you at Tier and for others in St. Alfred's and St. Luke's who are working in these areas of, of justice and compassion. And so please be assured of our prayers as you continue with your work. Thank you, Peter. Those prayers have meant a lot for us, particularly as we've gone through this time. So thank you for that. Savior to all, cause you rescue.
I hope you've enjoyed today's service. Um, it's been a great time of thinking about how to serve uh, God in our world, a world full of need and a world that's feeling a lot of pain at the moment. And I think if you go back uh, through this week and think again about this passage from Luke 4 and reflect again on what Mike has said and try and figure out what's God calling you to do and how can you do that, even in these restricted circumstances, how to show God's love to a hurting world. Um, it's a great privilege that we can do that and a great honour. So I hope uh, God by his spirit shows you how to do that. Now, uh, today, uh, as we watch online, um, there's an opportunity to join in three Zoom meetings if you'd like to meet one another. Members of St Alfred's are, are getting used to this. And uh, there are three different times uh, in the, today, uh, Sunday, I'm presuming you're watching this on Sunday, uh, when you can go onto a Zoom meeting. So I'm going to just look at my notes to make sure I get the times correct. Uh, the first one is between 11.30 and 12 o'clock for morning tea, and then there's a meeting just prior to what would be our, our usual evening service at 5.30 to 6 p.m., and then one again after what might have been our evening service at 7 to 7.30. All the login details for those Zoom meetings are in contact. This is a lovely way of just uh, connecting with one another and seeing one another again and being able to exchange news. So please join in with that. Also, please tell your friends about St Alfred's Online. It's a very easy way to invite people to church. And we're hearing that members of St Alfred's are sending out that invitation and we're getting lots of people who don't normally come to St Alfred's watching us online and so please just keep that going as part of our, our mission. Again, please send us any prayer requests, any questions you have, any feedback by using the form at the bottom of the St Alf's online page. Now we're going to conclude with a final prayer. You'll, this again will come up on the screen. Please join in with me. Let us pray. Eternal God and Father, by whose power we are created, and by whose love we are redeemed, guide and strengthen us by your Spirit, that we may give ourselves to your service and live this day in love to one another and to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ.
Amen.